Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to contribute to your very important gathering. I uh, apologize that I cannot be there in person. Um, let me just start by saying that um, these days I'm significantly more nervous speaking to any audience because uh, I don't feel as confident as I did as a 15-year-old activist in the anti-apartheid uh, movement where everything was pretty black and white literally and figuratively. Uh, perhaps the best way I can capture the anxiety I feel in engaging in conversations today is can be captured in the story, speaking to a group of American foundations some years ago during the Q&A, uh, a very upset delegate put up a hand and said, uh, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, I did. He inspired me and many people in my own country growing up under apartheid. And then she asked, do you know what his most famous speech was called? Thinking it was a trick question, I very gently said, I have a dream. And then she shouted back at me. She said, yes, it's I have a dream. But when I hear you speak, it sounds as you have a bloody nightmare. The forests are disappearing. The oceans are rising. Fascism is on the rise. Inequality is uh, skyrocketing and so on. In this anecdote lies one of the biggest challenges of leadership in the moment of history that we find ourselves in. How can activism do two complicated things at the same time? How can we, on the one hand, not sanitize the truth, speak truth to power, speak out again uh, 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 with regard to the urgency of the moment that we find ourselves in, but at the same time ensure that we do so in a way that not, does not demotivate, immobilize, depress, and send a message to people that it's far too late. So with that, I'm going to do a little experiment, and I need the support of the moderator here. I'm going to pose a question to you at this point and ask, uh, give you three options, right? And I'd like you to choose one of the options. With regard to where we are to address the climate crisis right now, Option one would be you think that actually things are more or less on track, that our government and business leaders have it under control, and that the worst effects of climate change will not happen, which is the complete uh, extinction of our species. Option two is you think actually it is a really, really big crisis, but you think that actually it's possible for us to turn things around and that the window of opportunity you recognize in option two is small but fast closing, but you still believe we can broaden out that opportunity. And the option three, it's too late, we don't have hope, or as some people more expressively uh, exp uh, give this option, and I'm quoting here, we are fucked option, okay? So those are the three options. So I just would like you to Jan Willem, to just give me a sense by show of hands in the audience. Uh, so if people, if you can say each of the three options and and give me a sense of where people are in the room, I'd appreciate that quickly. So you got to do, do that? that now. I will do that okay. now. One minute. So on track is number one. Crisis is number two. And too late is number three. Yes. <laughs> so who is number one? <laughs> Right. Okay, who is in crisis? Both. Oh. And uh, yeah, that's 50-60%. Okay, and too late? 10-20%. Okay. So the breakdown is... So, uh, Kumi, uh, the, the, the score is as follows. Uh, nobody thinks we are on track. 60% thinks we are in crisis. And about 10-20% thinks we are too late. Okay, and then uh, twenty percent uh, we're th still thinking about it, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so this is the result. I should tell you that one normally gets when I do this exercise in engaging with people, and and so when I first started this exercise, ah, good to see you, good to see you. Uh, so when I first started doing this about two years ago, there were still people actually in option one. There were 
still the majority in option two, and there was a small minority in, uh, you know, 10, 15% in maximum in option three. Today, the result that you have delivered is the result you I I, I experience in whether I'm speaking in the global south or in, in, in the north. Therefore, I want to start this presentation about rethinking activism in a way by making this most important point. The moment of history that we find ourselves in is one in which pessimism is a luxury we simply cannot afford. And the pessimism that justifiably emerges from our analysis, our observations, and our lived experiences must, can, and should be overcome by the optimism of our thought, our creativity, and our action. If I'm brutally honest with you, there are days when I wake up where I'm on option two, and there are days when I wake up where I'm on option three. And during the days, sometimes I'm fluctuating between two and three. But the spirit that we keep in the conversations that you're having at this conference and in the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis has to be one in which we tell ourselves that the world that we have before us is find ourselves in is been called, called many things a poly crisis um, a convergence of crises um, I called it in a book uh, boiling point and so on and I think it's fair enough to say that we are living in the most consequential decade in humanity's history and what happens in the remaining you know before we get to the 2030 deadline that to 20 in 2018 uh, the IPCC said for us when they said we had 12 years to get emissions to peak and start coming down drastically. Um, all of that is on what's at the, on the table. So the challenge we have is that, you know, if we look at this diagram on the screen, what we saw with COVID is what we need to see on the part of government and business with regard to climate change and biodiversity collapse, right? That that same level of urgency and, and it shows that when there is political will, exceptional things can happen. And therefore, today we have to recognize that the crisis that we are in is one that will take a superhuman effort to turn around but we have to tell ourselves that it's within our capability and it is within our capability. I want to say something firstly to align with what conversations you're having at your conference. Sadly, we thought slavery was gone. We thought genocide was largely gone. And today we live in a world where genocide has made a return. Uh, and some of the countries that claim to be promoters of democracy, that contributed most to the making up of the genocide conventions and so on, now scoff at it when they are called upon to make a, a moral judgment of what is happening uh, in Gaza. So, but the ecocide conversation, when it first started, when I was at Greenpeace, I can tell you, at that time, I struggled. I, I personally supported it right from the get-go um, when Polly came to see me the first time and continue to support it. But many people have the sense that working to put too much of energy on ecocide is never going to succeed. And right now, what I want to say very strongly, that the ideas that people say will not succeed because it's unrealistic, it's romantic, it's idealistic, are probably the ideas that we need to be uh, giving most attention to, as uh, you will hear from my argument a little bit later. So I want to, at the outset, express my solidarity with the efforts, but raise the problem that litigation as a route for change is a challenge because 
of how slow the wheels of justice turn. That does not mean we should not take this work seriously. Now, when we come out of a poly crisis, right, and I just want to take three crises, the 1997 Asian financial crisis that then spread around certain parts of the world, the 2008-2009 financial crisis, and COVID. When we are in the middle of the crisis, right, you will find moments of sanity on the part of our leaders. So like in 1997, when these crises pose how inept our systems are to address social and economic justice, climate justice, gender justice, or any other parts of the agenda that we are concerned with in the global justice movement, you will find words that emerge that seem to express courage. So in 1997, in the middle of that Asian financial crisis, we heard talk of Clinton, the president of the World Bank, UN Secretary General, all were saying, the world needs a new financial architecture. And then also, when we're in the middle of COVID, in the worst moments of it, you will heard leaders saying, we need to build back better and not just build back what we had. But what you see happening is that once they get out of the crisis and once they've put a Band-Aid on it, they continue with business as usual. And on the left-hand side of the slide is what they generally do which is system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. When what is most urgently needed is system innovation, system transformation, and system redesign. So I'm now going to just take you through certain things that I think activism needs to challenge itself on and to uh, embrace as core strategies moving forward. So the first thing I want to say is we have to commit to creative maladjustment. So let me just explain this concept. In 1965, Martin Luther King said, um, my friends, as I come to the end of the speech, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, none of us want to be maladjusted and suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to be well adjusted to. He goes on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry, racial discrimination, and on the economy, he says, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. Unquote. Now, if that was relevant to the United States in the mid-60s, it's a thousand times or more relevant to the United States, but to the entire world that we have, a world that is so broken and that we are struggling to actually deal with our own cognitive dissonance, which is the denial of the reality. So Albert Einstein puts it in a different way, where he says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Now, I just want to ask you, right, is to just close your eyes for a minute and ask yourself this question. Does this definition resonate with my reality? And I ask you to open your hand and you'll see that I have my hand up. If I'm brutally honest, I meet that definition of insanity. I can justify it and say, you know, I acted in good faith. It was what we thought was going to get us there. But the reality is, we if we do what we always did, we will get what we always got. And what we've always got for on sustainability, on democracy, on human rights, and so on, economic justice especially, land rights, all of these issues has been much less than what we need and what our people deserve. So, Resisting cognitive dissonance is, create, uh, is critically important. So yeah, why is this is happening in part? And if you look at the investment from those of the organizations in the North that support organizations in the South, uh, philanthropy more generally, is that if you look at three levels of change, right? How you can seek change, macro, meso, micro, right? By ma macro, I mean governance change. By meso, I mean policy change. And by micro, I mean delivery 
of projects and programs. So if you look at how long it takes you for a period of success when you're trying to do a big governance change, you're talking a much longer period. Policy change, you can take a domestic violence campaign and you can get a domestic violence act passed within a particular shorter period of time. It can be even shorter than two years if you get lucky. And then on addressing the symptoms of the problem by the delivery of projects and programs, you can do it in a much shorter time. But then when we look at where the levels of investment are, resources, headspace, discourse, all of that, it's still 80% focused on delivery of projects and programs. And we need to put much, much more resources under governance change and policy change. So therefore, I just want to say that today, when we look at, you know, the resourcing of activism, I would say that we have far too much, too, too much philanthropy and too little philanthropy. Having said that, I do believe that when we look at where the business community is, where governments are, look at what's happening in the Netherlands with the right-wing government and threats of uh, big cuts in uh, funding and all of that, uh, I will still say that the philanthropic community, even though we recognize in the global south that they're structurally racist and so on, still has probably the most capability to contribute in this current moment that we find ourselves in. So the other thing we need to do is stop paying lip service to intersectionality, right? This was a wisdom, as most of you know, given to us by the feminist movement decades ago, saying that if you want to advance gender equality, you need to understand how gender intersects with class, race, ability, and so on. And one of the mistakes we've made in terms of climate activism and environmental activism more generally um, is we placed the challenge of climate in an environmental box, in an environmental silo, when in fact climate change is a cross-cutting issue that cuts across um, you know, the, our economy, our energy system, our transport system, our food system, and so on. And so one of the critical things that we need to do is to really turbocharge intersectionality in our thinking, in our practice, and in our consciousness. I've covered uh, this point already, which is we need to resist, stop denying uh, reality. And I'm sure people in this audience are not doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, not doing that in your analysis. But the truth is, all of us to survive sometimes have to engage in, in some form of denial of reality, otherwise getting through the day can be too much. And I'm, I would love for that question to come up when we go to Q&A. The next thing we also need to do is embrace a culture of emergence. Cultural emergence refers to the process through which new cultural phenomena, patterns, or movements arise and become established within a society or community. What is different, if, if I look at how, like especially when I was at Greenpeace and Amnesty, or even when I was at Civicus, World Alliance for Citizen Participation. If I was before an audience, the, my colleagues supporting me would sort of lead me down a delusional way of thinking, which I, I'm not saying that it wasn't there, in, the delusion wasn't in me already, but where when you, when you speak to people and you try to mobilize them, you go there with the message of, we need to do A, B, C, D, E. And what is often the tone of it is we have arrived at knowledge and we know what needs to be done and you just need to join us. That does not serve us well. That does not offer an invitation to people to want to come and participate and to be part of the process. If we say to people instead, we know the broad direction that we need to go on is to reduce emissions. The broad direction we need to go on is increase gender equality. The broad direction we need to go on is to ensure that land rights of indigenous peoples and forest dwelling communities and others are not eroded, right? But by saying that we know what the broad direction is can be said in a way where we say, well, the details of exactly how we're going to get there in terms of renewable energy, how much is going to be solar, wind, geothermal, et cetera, et cetera. 
and having a culture of emergence being um, embraced is more honest, it's more authentic. We should not be arrogant in thinking that we are somehow through our privilege, education, and so on, have, have, have arrived at the answer of all the solutions. Because quite frankly, we might think, say in February of 2023, uh, 2022, that we knew roughly how things are going to play out in Europe with regard to climate change performance. And then suddenly you have a shock like the invasion of Ukraine. And then you see European governments, for example, rolling back their commitments and so on. So things are very fluid. And in a fluid world, it is better for us to be light-footed on our feet, be willing to adapt and not create a, a mythology which nobody un, uh, believes anyway, that we are the holders of absolute truth. It does not serve us well. The other challenge we have in terms of how we deploy our time is to recognize that, and, and yeah, I want to say, Everything that might sound as a criticism, I just want you to know it's all self-criticism, okay? Uh, so one of the biggest criticism that I've made of myself is how over the years, from my activism in South Africa, uh, especially after we won the democratic uh, first democratic elections uh, and got democracy in place right up to the present, has been mistaking access to power for influence over power. So, like, say, in the post-apartheid period, all ministers were inviting us for consultations on white papers and green papers and so on. And in good faith, we would get together, we'd spend hours and hours preparing for it, go into those meetings and thinking that we're going to influence what's going to happen. And when I reflect on, especially when I was at Greenpeace and Amnesty, I can tell you 90% of the meetings that I went into or even more, actually. I knew what they're going to say. They knew what I'm going to say. I knew where the meeting was going to end. They knew where the meeting was going to end. And then, whether it was a minister, president of World Bank, Secretary General of UN, or a local government official, same pattern, where when we walk out of those meetings, we tick a box saying government or corporate advocated on, and they tick a box saying civil society consulted. Now, I'm not saying that we should not engage with government and business. I'm not saying that. However, what I am saying is that we absolutely don't have the proportionality right. The amount of time we spend looking to those who have power and appealing to them to do the right thing, and the amount of time we gaze down to the powerless, right, is not balanced. Because let's be blunt about it. Governments will only listen to us when we can show that we have the powerless behind us in sizable numbers, which could spell electoral consequences for them. And if we're not able to mobilize that level of participation, governments in democratic countries can legitimately say, why should we listen to you? You have not shown that you have a significant constituency of people behind you, whereas we have won elections, even however bad run those elections are but that's a from a conventional democratic argument uh, i have to concede that it does have some currency the other mistake we have made within activism over the decades as i reflect now is that we have imagined that the biggest challenge that we have is the repressive state apparatus by which i mean army police use of formal laws and so on and let's be clear Things are getting exceptionally repressive, particularly for environmental activism, particularly for indigenous peoples, particularly for frontline communities. Okay, if we just take what Global Witness has been tracking about 10 years ago, it was a bad enough statistic when they told us that every week, on average, two environmental activists get killed. Right now, the average has gone up to four environmental activists getting killed every single uh, week, right, when you average it out. And then when we look around the world in countries that claim to be democracies as well, there's countries that are more hesitant democracies, what you see is uh, closing of 
civic space, especially curtailment of freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and freedom of expression. Bad as the repressive state apparatus is, I want to suggest that the bigger challenge we have is not the repressive state apparatus, as was pointed out uh, in academic work in the 70s. Uh, the bigger challenge we face is the ideological state apparatus. By the ideological state apparatus, we mean the framework for education, the framework for religion, the framework for the funding of arts and culture, and most importantly, the framework for communications and media. And so today, what we are, find that activism as an inequitable access to the mainstream media space, uh, if we look at the domination of that ownership in terms of corporate ownership or state ownership, that has been one of the most powerful drivers of misinformation, disinformation, and giving us the kinds of election results that we are seeing in the United States and elsewhere where we thought certain kinds of fascist expressions were put behind us. We see it is coming forward with gusto and energy at the moment. So in the context hey, Mr. of... Naidu, I'm going to be polite and strict. Could you please... Yes, I'm just about to round uh, up. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, basically... Um, one of the main weaknesses has been that when we have tried to advocate and move people, especially with environmental activism, we have aimed all our efforts at the brain. We have talked about science, facts and figures, one, one and a half degrees, 350 parts per million, and so on. And in the process, what we have done is we've ignored the heart, body, and soul. And so one of the things that we look at what, say, Donald Trump and a lot of the right-wing, far-right politicians do, they bypass, they bypass the brain completely. They don't focus on, you know, the... Yeah, they don't focus on um, facts. I'm not saying we need to lie. We absolutely should not lie, but we don't need to be so boring with the truth. And and I want to end then with these words from Maya Angelou, a poet from the United States, by saying this. Um, if we do not mobilize people on a scale that we have never mobilized people before, to support their mental health, to get because uh, participation itself is going to be a very important thing to support mental health as it gets worse as a result of climate anxiety and eco-anxiety. Uh, we have to be thinking about how we move people on a scale. And many people are too busy struggling to survive and they don't have the time to actually engage with all the details that some of us might be able to. So therefore, we have to have a more people-centric approach in the way we approach things. And I would just like to leave you with these words from Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And activism now must make people feel hopeful, courageous, daring, giving them a sense of uh, perseverance and giving them a sense that it's not fundamentally too late. Of course, for the people who've died already from climate impacts, it's already too late but we are still within the window of opportunity that we can secure this planet for the majority of people for generations and generations to come. Thank you very much and sorry if I took too long. Um, uh, uh, Kumi, I propose that I will collect uh, three questions from the audience and then uh, pass them to you. Uh, please, um, questions. You have raised some very interesting issues, like we are boxing climate change into the environment. Influence, does it matter with the government? And of course, uh, the issue of repressive government, what we see all over the place, how to deal with it. Uh, we can collect three questions for Kumi Naidu, please. 
Hey, many thanks for a really nice mission uh, related talk. So I want to pick up on the art of the point that you made. I'm thinking of really impactful exhibitions, creative interventions that are been fantastic to engage with. But how do you get all kinds of feet into those rooms? I think that artivism still has a very limited reach to those who hold themselves open, who are interested in consumative change, who might not have thought of different ways. But for those who are engaging with these struggles, and for those who are quite apathetically aware of them, but being self serving in their actions, I wonder if uh, you also see some scope for change through artivism. Um, yeah. Thank you. Notice. One question here. Uh, thank you very, very much for an inspiring talk. Um, I just want to pick up on your first one, your first points, and your last point. And I couldn't agree more about the, the COVID lockdown. Uh, there was conclusive evidence that it can be done. Change at a, a, a striking energy level can be done. It's a political business there. And then you ended by saying we need to mobilize billions. Um, how do we move from that sort of COVID moment to the if you like the climate and biodiversity moment. Uh, what is what was what was specific about the COVID crisis that, if you like, enabled governments to mobilize billions to lock down? Uh, why can't we do that now? Why won't they do that now? What is what is what can we kind of introduce into this? I think the artivism uh, is wonderful and so on, but I think the, the lesson from COVID is that this can be done. It is possible to mobilize billions. But we need to find the tricks to, to do that again right now as soon as possible. Thank you, Notice. One last question before I pass it back to Kumi. Rebecca. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. I particularly took note about what you said about influence versus access versus influence. Or in other words, um, rather than a seat at the table. How do we get to studying the table? I would be interested in hearing your um, proposal for strategies to get into the point where there can actually be influence in uh, spaces of decision making. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Pumi, do you want me to repeat the questions or uh, have you heard them? I think I got them, but you are very good at saying it briefly. So go ahead and just say them. The, the first question was on uh, ar art, uh, activism uh, uh, about the, the limited reaches ha it has now and what it's, what, how to reach uh, marginalized populations. Uh, the second one was on uh, well, the potential of government. Uh, we, we, we saw the COVID-19 measures and uh, the, the potential overhaul of, uh, of all sorts of drastic measures. And could, could we repeat that for the environment and, and for social justice? And the third one, um, well, the question on strategies, rather than securing a seat on the table, can we also set the table and uh, do something? Okay, so let me Pretty start sure. with the last. Let me start with the last question. Uh, I very much like that the shape of the tables are usually wrong to start with. Uh, the size of the table is wrong, and who is sitting where at the table is usually wrong, right? Now. Uh, Fridays for the Future describes, or people within Fridays for the Future describe the engagement with government and business as handshake activism. Now, I think this we don't have an option but to engage, right? But we have to be very strategic in recognizing that they need the engagement sometimes more than we need the engagement. And they get more out of it because they get PR value out of it uh, and so on, which makes them to appear more, uh, if you want, benign and uh, less um, you know, dangerous uh, than their actions actually are. So uh, so there's no easy answer to this. But, but the main point here is not that we should not engage in better ways than we currently engage. One is we should think about the proportionality of that engagement, how much of time we're putting there. But I am actively saying, if we don't look at the powerless and to, to move them into understanding and a sense of urgency, 
then we will continue to see what we are seeing in elections all across the world where right-wing fanatics are actually capturing significant sections of their population in ways in which we never envisaged would have happened even you know, 10, 15 years ago. Then on the second question on uh, how do we shift the urgency or why is it not possible to shift the urgency that we saw from COVID to the urgency around, say, getting off our addiction of fossil fuels? Uh, this is an important question that requires a longer answer. But just to say that we got a real problem that we might have deluded ourselves that we lived under democracies for a long time, but basically our democracies are controlled by some very powerful industries and who funds what and so on. So, for example, the fossil fuel industry today still receives trillions of dollars in uh, taxpayer funded, funded subsidies uh, because energy is in the national interest. They still exercise far too much, um, you know, uh, influence over governance and policy making. However, things are changing because let me let me just say that the post-COVID reality for me personally is is quite schizophrenic, right? On the one hand, I don't remember a time that things were so bad in the world in terms of progressive values and so on. I mean, yeah, you know, if you look at the United States today, you know, even uh, a woman's right to choose has been stripped off uh, many. So we're seeing some really awful things happening in the world. But let me tell you where my optimism comes from. In this moment of history, I also see there's never been a moment where I can remember where people are saying in larger and larger numbers, we don't, we, we, we don't need incremental tinkering and baby steps in the right directions. There's never been as many people and organizations saying we have to address structural and systemic change, and we're also seeing that even within powerful philanthropic organizations. Then on the power of artivism, let me just say quite uh, upfront, harnessing the power of arts and culture alone to break through the communications deficit that activism face will not deliver our salvation from the climate crisis and the intersecting crises. However, failure to harness the power of arts and culture right now, I would argue almost guarantees that we're going to uh, uh, fail. Having said that, the question is really appropriate and well taken, that a lot of the art and culture investments is typically, if you want, on the elite side, if you look at where the biggest amounts of money goes into museums and so on. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for that, but what I'm talking about here is popular culture in its broadest sense, right? So I just want to give you one positive story, and that is uh, UN Live Museum for the United Nations, uh, on whose board I serve, over the last two years has been working with live streaming companies like Spotify. And we have just launched a thing called Sounds Right, where we've got musicians across the world who are using the sounds of nature in their music. Right, And so if you go on Spotify and you say featuring nature, you'll see that it's one of the top performers since we launched it in April. The logic there is if those of us in this audience who are not musicians try to talk to people, the 2.5 billion people on, 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 on live streaming platforms of different kinds, why would they listen to us? But if it's musicians that they love and respect and they get pleasure from, start saying to them in gentle ways and not in sledgehammer ways that you have to embrace nature. Nature is about human survival, all of that. The chances of us reaching significantly larger numbers of people becomes better. Uh, and I'll just close with a non-elite example of what's in this vision. So in Arare, Zimbabwe, there's a iconic playwright called Davs Guza who is seeking to put shipping containers in Arari townships as multi-purpose community art centers where at some moments of the days people can come in and uh, make music, uh, show movies in the evenings, uh, time for writers to gather and do workshops and so on. So your question is very well taken. 
arts and culture has the power to shift consciousness on a much larger scale. It's always been done. And by the way, the right wing has used it, the fascists in, in, in Europe during the Second World War used it very powerfully and so on. So I'm not saying that we should use it in ways which are disrespectful of people's autonomy and so on, but we can use it to educate people, move them into action. And I can tell you, in South Africa, where most of our people were unable to read and write, we would never have been able to mobilize on the scale that we did uh, without music, without dance, without theater, without uh, song, uh, without uh, visual art and so on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kumi. Um... I have one last bridging question, uh, and I take my power here as a moderator. Um, what do you, what potential do you see in uh, in the rights of nature movements that are now occurring everywhere? Uh, and we also see them in the Netherlands. Uh, we have now an organization, and they will speak later today. Uh, that's called Forest that Owns Itself, and we have the Embassy of the North Sea. Uh, both organizations, uh, well, in a way, claim to speak on behalf of nature. Uh, what potential do you see uh, for uh, deepening the search for social justice? So let me answer this question slightly differently, right? Let's ask this question, how will this resonate with people, ordinary people around the world who are not as committed to addressing these issues as we might be. For many of those people that say, what are these people talking about? They've gone completely crazy and so on. But let me say, precisely at this moment we are in, the crazy ideas, those ideas, you know, we need to be creatively maladjusted to the norm and the status quo. So I think that uh, this movement, I've been part of it in the periphery, uh, working with Olafur Eliasson, the artist based in Berlin. Uh, and I fully, fully support investing in this because I, you know, maybe this is a good way for me to end my contribution. People like me have said probably far too many times on in speeches, save the planet, save the climate, save the environment. I want to end with some good news, right? The planet is fine. The planet actually does not need saving, right? If we continue on the trajectory and the path that we're on, the end result is we deplete our water resources, destroy our soil, it gets hotter and hotter that we cannot plant food. The end result is we will be gone, the planet will still be here, right? And once we become extinct as a species, the oceans will recover, the forests will recover. So don't worry about the planet in that sense that we need to understand that humanity's survival is fundamentally, fundamentally connected to the, uh, on us pro protecting our ecological assets and putting energies into ecocide, putting energies into the rights of non, the more than human beings, if you want. Uh, these are things that, um, I would support engaging in, but let me just conclude by saying, but we got to do it in a way that we can communicate it to ordinary people that, A, this is why we're doing it. This is why your water that you take for granted, already water is being destroyed and being depleted and polluted and so on. That is what we're going to need for your children and your grandchildren's future. And so, you know, making sure we can protect the river and give that river rights is not simply about the river. It's about human survival, right? And I'm sad to say human beings are super selfish, right? So if you cannot find a human-centric benefit of giving rights to nature and making that central to the conversation, uh, I, sus I, I, I fear we won't succeed. And, and let's also be honest that for people who are living from, you know, one plate of food to another plate of food and don't know when the next plate of food is coming, if we have to keep them in our minds and think like, how will they react when they 
year, there are people who are fighting for the rights of animals and trees and so on. And we must be able to answer that question in a human-centric way such that such a person says, ah, that makes sense to me and that's why I should also support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to me. Um, we will I will close this meeting now and proceed with the more physical element of the gathering. Thank you very much, and I wish you all well. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Be in touch. Thank you. Bye bye.